So why don't we put the avionics of F-35 inside an F-16 and we're done. If you believe this, we need to have a conversation. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that this time more than ever will help you make sense of why some choices are made and some others are not. And today we are talking about the choice of the United States Air Force of considering a 4 generation fighter to replace the aging fleet of the F-16 rather than updating the existing ones or buying the very latest versions. We will get to that at the end. But now let's start from the beginning. So what are you going to update on a fighter plane? Well, mostly the engine, avionics and other systems. It's all stuff that, at least at first sight, can just be swapped in and out. Other updates, uh, for example to the design of the wing or other aerodynamic changes, tend to be rare. If you want to radically change the design of the wing, the undercarriage position or the shape of the body of the fuselage, well, you end up interfering with a whole lot of other related elements. So partial redesign becomes a almost complete redesign very, very quickly. The engine in a fighter is essential, no need to say. It drives the performance of the plane and the performance of the plane drive the performance of the weapons. Acceleration, range, reliability, ease of servicing, all these parameters are heavily driven by the engine. A professor of mine at university used to say that with the right engine even a doghouse can fly. Well, I believe it's not going to fly very well anyway. Sorry, I'm digressing. Civil aviation engines tend to be similar and relatively easy to exchange. Military engines, on the contrary, share way fewer similarities. The first element to consider is the dimension. If an upgraded engine doesn't fit inside the space of the old engine, then you need a structural upgrade. This may not be trivial because the bulkheads where the thrust of the engine is applied tend to be particularly robust and the fuselage is built around them. Obviously, moving them around is a big change. So to upgrade the engine, you may easily end up with a structural upgrade in your hands as well. Another element is mass distribution. The movement of the aircraft's center of gravity is carefully controlled and it has a limited shift range. Actually, one important parameter driving the design of the control surfaces is the mass and weight distribution. Any change and problems in stability and control may happen. By the way, this is a general consideration that is always true. Whatever is added or removed from the plane that causes a, a significant change in the mass distribution may cause stability and control problems. The control surfaces may end up working with deflections far from the ideal, generating for example trim drag, their area may be too small so they are not authoritative enough, or it could even be too large, so uselessly large, adding weight and drag for no reason. On an aircraft, a significant change is actually a small change, if you compare it with what a ground vehicle or a ship can withstand. A third consideration is the engine auxiliaries. The engine is the source of mechanical and electrical power for all the onboard systems. So the new engine will have to provide the aircraft's power, possibly without too many changes to the systems. And this is a perfect segue to the next point. Here the problem is more complex because the layman can draw parallels with the commercial world of mobile devices or personal computing. Nothing could be further from reality. There is a terribly intricate maze of rules, 
regulation certification that make military avionics horribly expensive. In general, this means that military avionics needs to be hardened, and this means bulky black boxes that need adequate mounting because during the maneuver they get 9 Gs too. So, since we tend to add rather than remove, you need the physical room to accommodate the new boxes. To be fair, more modern design tend to push the modularity down to the board level, so a single black box cannot be completely full and can host uh, different cards or different PCBs. In case of update, you update a single board uh, in a box containing many of them. So a typical size problem. So a typical room problem is the size of the radum. It applies a constraint on the antenna surface, which in turn applies a constraint on the radar performance. Any change in size or shape, typically to house a larger antenna, can have important consequences on the aerodynamic performance. So it's better getting the Radoom design right the first time. Another element to consider is that the precautions that are required to avoid interference among different systems are connected to the physical layout and the structural design. So the room available may not be freely usable by the designer. With the new hardware also comes electrical power consumption. This is often an essential limiting factor because the generators connected to the engine are heavy, bulky and not easy to upgrade if necessary. Maybe the most important limiting factor to the upgradability of a fighter is the availability of electric power. To have enough power you really may need a drastic redesign or even an engine upgrade just for that. Software is even more complicated because aircraft computer systems are very different and are not at all similar to the networks and the system that we use in our everyday life. On a plane design in the 80s or the 90s, like the F-22 or the Eurofighter, there are several computers, each one dedicated to a specific task, like controlling the weapons, controlling the fuel, managing the hydraulics, managing the air conditioning, or with fly-by-wire, even flying the plane. The, the main standards at the time, like the MIL STD-1553 uh, for the communication networks or the MIL STD-1760 for uh, the stores, were low-level standards dictating the hardware, the electrical properties and the type of signals and frequencies in use, but not much else. Designers had to establish their own protocols and then write the software to implement them. It was as if a developer had to write an implementation of the TCPAP every time he wrote a new piece of software. Sorry, 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 sorry. The TCPAP is a protocol. That is the language that two different computers speak, the language that they have in common to communicate. If I'm developing an application for your phone or for your computer, I don't have to uh, reteach the application, the TCPAP. It is already there. Uh, Windows or Android or iOS, uh, that's exactly the main job that they do. Provide this kind of services to the people uh, who uh, develop the applications. When it comes to the avionics of a few decades ago, there really was nothing comparable to uh, an operating system. And that's the reason why they had to make everything from scratch every time they made uh, something new or they made a change. This means that the software running, for example, on the air data computer and the armament computer is written ad hoc to make the two communicate. If you wanted to reuse one of them in a different context, you would have to rewrite most of the software. Actually, a large part of the integration of new avionics on an older platform is actually writing ad hoc code to make the new and the old communicate. However, there is another more subtle problem. The black boxes software used to be monolithic. 
it was as if there was a single executable running from the memory and on the processor. Please allow me, this analogy is not strictly true, it's, in, it's a broad generalization, but um, just to explain the point. The problem with this design, since everything is lumped together, is that if you change one part of the software, you have to recertify everything else. For example, if you add a new box that uses the data from the Air Data Computer for the very fact that you have connected the Air Data Computer to the new box, you will have to recertify and retest completely the Air Data Computer. You will have to control that it's actually reading the data correctly, it's processing them correctly, it's distributing them correctly to everything else, and the addition did not create any problem to anything else. So all of a sudden you may have an expensive flight test campaign, even if the new boxes that you added have nothing to do with flying the plane. At this point, it's easy to understand that if you keep adding hardware to the platform, the complexity of the integration process keep growing. For time, costs keep increasing and you may well get to the point where the upgrade is pretty much as expensive or let's say in the same order of magnitude of a new platform. Any sensible human at this point will consider if it is the case of artificially keep alive the old platform or just procuring an entirely new platform. I have to say that this is actually changed because it was unsustainable. For example, the F-35 and the Gripen EF have been designed with different software architecture. These are considered open architectures where you can add hardware and software without recertifying everything else. You will never get to the point of being plug and play, but yes, the integration process is greatly simplified. If you think that all of this is complex enough, we are not done yet. There is another problem which is very important and it is an enemy of modern avionics. Heat. Yes, because every computer, even the simplest ones, have an internal clock. The faster the clock, the hotter the electronics is running. No use to say modern avionics have high speed clocks and tend to run very hotly. For example, on the F-35 is a big problem and the plane has two big non stealthy scoops just for electronics cooling. On the future British Tempest, heat dissipation is one of the main design parameters that have been considered since the inception. Miniaturization that helps with all the room problems that we have discussed before actually increases the problems because it also increases the temperatures. Once more, in life, there are no free lunches. So, now you have an idea of the kind of issues you may run into when a 4th generation fighter is being upgraded. So, what about let's put the avionics of the F-35 inside the F-16? Well, I believe that at this point you may be able to tell me exactly what is going to happen. Probably it won't fit inside. If it fits, probably the plane wouldn't have enough electrical power to run it. If it had the power, it will probably fry itself for lack of cooling. All of this while ruining the plane's weight balance. The contracts involving the F-16V or the Block 70 have been very expensive. For example, the Bahrain sale was around 70 million per plane. This is not too far from the current cost of an F-35. Well, now you know why. These have been extensive upgrades that required an extensive redesign of systems and components. When Lockheed Martin says that the F-21 is basically a completely new plane, well, obviously it's marketing, but it's also true in a sense that the kind of effort that is required for a, such a radical improvement is not too far from a, yeah, 
a complete design from scratch. Aerodynamics and structures have progressed more slowly than avionics, so it makes sense to upgrade an old platform with new avionics. But with this upgrade, you get to the point where the cost becomes comparable with the acquisition of the entirely new platform, and at that point, it becomes reasonable to consider something totally new. So, if you like this video, I am sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please, as usual, like, dislike, and if this is your first time here, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar and Patreon, you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very, very much for watching. Please stay safe wherever you are and see you in the next video.